In today's episode of Eater Properties New Builder Series, we're going to be interviewing Adam Liddell, a building consultant. So his role is to go out and check the quality of the build and give you, the builder or the client engaging the builder, a report on the building progress. He's got some really good insights into the sort of things that you should be looking for when you engage a builder and through the building process. So hello and welcome to the Eater Property Builder Series where we help new builders navigate the sometimes complex process of building a new home. So this is all about understanding the best ways to build a new home, the things that you need to know about legislation, the building process, etc. And today we're really excited. We've got Adam Liddell that uh, we're questioning about building consultants, which is very different to building surveyors. And we're going to find out the difference in a minute. So welcome, Adam. Thank you Hello, for joining us. Hello, how are we? Good, yeah, good to you. see you. Good to see you. So let's start with what do you do in the whole building process? What's your role? Okay, so I'm a registered builder or known as a building consultant yep. and essentially what we do is we're engaged by clients to attend in a new construction period um, process at each stage yep. to essentially monitor how the project's going yep. and then to report back on any works that we think that aren't quite up to standard or incomplete. Okay, so you're working on behalf of the person that is engaged the builder yep. and you're checking their work really. Yeah, and it generally with Newcon it, it aligns with the stage payments. Right. So in a Newcon there's uh, five main stages. What's a Newcon? Oh, new construction, uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> no no, no yeah. acronym. No, no, new, <laughs> a new, new con, new yep. construction. Yep. Uh, so generally in a contract uh, with a builder, there's five stages. Yes. And that's the time that you're allowed to go along to check the builder's work and make sure that you're happy with it. Okay. And because there's quite a bit of technical stuff involved at times, we come along and represent the client at those stages. Okay. So um, let's go back to that in a minute, the stages, because I've got lots of questions about the stages. Yep. But I want to go back to what the comment I made in the beginning, which is there's, there's all these different people that come into a build, right? And it yep. gets really confusing for the person that's contracting the builders. So one of the things is a surveyor versus yes. a consultant and an inspector. I sort of thought when I started in this game 10 years ago, <laughs> you were all the same, but that's wrong. No, so the yeah. building surveyor is kind of the, the top of the chain, food chain, yep. and they're the person that issues the permits to, to, so that the building can start or the construction can start. Right. And then under him is generally a building inspector that will represent the surveyor at each stage to check that the works have been done in um, compliance with the codes and regulations. Okay, okay, so they're there more for the codes to Correct. To, to, uh, to approve the next stage, etc. Yeah. but more to make sure that it's it's more of a, I guess, an association requirement, is that right? Uh, it, well, it's a legal requirement, it's a legislative okay. requirement okay. That, that the building works are done as per the National Construction Code, okay. Australian Standards yep. and Manufacturer's Specifications. Okay. So they, they're kind of the authority, if that makes sense. Right. Um, what we then do is, is come in and check sort of additional works to make sure that the works are done in a, in a workmanlike manner yep. and they're not at a substandard level. Okay, so you're looking for um, uh, the quality of the build. Yep. So can you give me an example, and, and the, the surveyor's not, so if it's poor workmanship but it meets the requirements, and would there be an example where that could happen? Most definitely, look, on a job on yesterday, there's yep. what we refer to as an expansion joint which goes down the middle of a uh, brick wall. Yep. Uh, for some reason or not, the bricklayer hadn't allowed that to go all the way to the ground. Right. So it was it was inhibiting the, the uh, requirement of the joint to expand. Yes. So we then notify that and the report goes back to the builder and the builder gets the opportunity to rectify that okay. prior to the handover stage. And was that something that the surveyor wouldn't pick up? Uh, th they at times will, but yeah. at other times they're looking more for that, you know, national construction code requirement, right. whereas that's probably, it, it's, it's across both areas, but it's substandard workmanship as well. Okay. So. And so you're required by law to have a surveyor? Yes. You're not required by law to have a consultant, so you are privately engaged Correct. by the builder. Okay. Yeah, but right. having said that, in the uh, contract, you're entitled to bring in somebody to represent you yep. to, to monitor the works, okay. check the works. And how long have you been in this role? Uh, well, I've been, a, I've been in the construction game for 35 years. Right. Uh, I've been a registered builder since 2010, and I've been doing building consultancy for probably the last five to six years. Okay. So if you were giving advice to, you've got a son, Yes. if you were giving advice to your son, let's say he's old enough to build his own home, yep. I'm assuming that you'd tell him to, to get a consultant. Yes. Tell me some of the reasons, like what, what would you want to say to some of the Australian potential builders out there about whether or not they choose a consultant? Well, look, the challenge is, is yep. and a lot of the builders are, have a really great product, as you're probably aware now, yep. but what happens is, is when you're going through and selecting a builder, 
you go through the sales process and that's kind of one team from yep. the company. Yep. Then you become to the to the site and you have a site supervisor who's been appointed to look after your particular project. Mm -hmm. Now I spoke with one of them yesterday and he was managing about 30 jobs all over the state. So these guys are time poor and have a lot going on. So they don't necessarily have the time or um, the allowance to spend with clients answering questions. So we'll go through, we'll take a phone call at any stage right. and answer some of the questions, you know, when's this going to be done? Why has that been done this way? How did that work? Right. When can I expect that finished? So, right. so there's a range of stuff that we can offer. So it's partly informing the client. It's not just picking faults in the build. No, no. And yep. I, I don't look at it as picking faults. I look at it as a, a, a fresh set of eyes to help the builder through the process. Right. So you've got to remember that uh, in a new build, it's, it's a product that's got thousands of individual components mm -hmm. put together by humans. Yep. So things aren't always perfect. Yep. So the more times that you can have you know, independent eyes or, you know, QA from the builders looking over it or their own trades, yep. you're going to end up with a far better product. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So the building surveyor, the one that, not sorry, the building inspector or the, the site manager. Yeah, that site you, supervisor. Site supervisor, yeah. thank you. <laughs> that you met with yesterday, and I'm in the industry, so yeah. imagine how confusing it yeah, is for people yeah. that aren't, right? Yeah. So that you met with yesterday was looking after 30 houses. I want to stop there for a second, yeah. okay, because this is really interesting. You've got one person that's responsible for checking these houses and really the quality controls all in their hands. Is that right? Yeah, and look, they do, the, the major companies now have their own in-house QA. Yes. Um, but again, they're dealing with high volume. What's QA? Quality assurance. Quality assurance, so, okay, yeah. yeah. So. And they're, they're dealing with high quality. High volume. High volume, Yeah, okay. and, and, and also through a construction process, yeah. it's forever evolving. So what one Q, QA or quality assurance person or one consultant sees on one day, the site may have changed to a day later. And again, I'll go back to that place yesterday. I arrived and all the downpipes hadn't been installed, yes. but there was a plumber on site around the back fixing them on. So by the time I'd left, they'd been installed. Right. So, you know, right. if I'd been there an hour early, they were in a report, oh. an hour later, they're not. So, so sometimes they just haven't had the chance to actually report on, yeah. I mean, complete the complete the process. Correct. Right? And you know, right. when you're managing 30 properties and you're yep. working a 50 hour week, you do yep. the numbers on that. At best, you're probably spending an hour to two hours yep. on each site on or each, each job. Site. It's so a it's, really big job, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and there's a, yeah. there's, a, there's a lot of pressure on these site supervisors yep. and they do, a, you know, by most means they do a good job. Yep. It's just that it's it's really a lot of yep. um, coordinating, a lot of information, a lot of requirements yep. they've got to deal with. Yep. So back to the question, then do they have the time to put into somebody that may not have been through a building process before? Yep. Um, yeah, it's hard for them they to don't. do that. They yeah. don't. And so you're almost a second set of eyes for them. They might welcome you, I'm assuming, because you that you do another check for them. Well, most definitely. Yeah. And with that one yesterday and the one we've done previously with you, I'll go down the road of getting the supervisor's contact details. Yes. And we CC them into the report straight away. Yes. So that they can get the feedback and then work through right. the items. Right. Uh, a lot of the bigger companies, again, will, will do a formal response to our reports. Okay. Saying, yes, we agree with this and then the works are going to be rectified. So if... if I'll cut back to the supervisor for one more question. How many is the right number of properties? Is 30 okay? What's the wrong number? Because I often say to clients, let's find out how many houses this supervisor is going to be looking after before we engage. Yeah, and, build, and right? that's one of the things I would suggest yeah. is find out how many they're doing. Now, yeah. if you're talking uh, four bedroom standard home, yeah. somewhere 15 to 18, perhaps 20. Okay. Because there's varying stages from site preparation to the concrete to finishing stages. So there's yep. different requirements um, that they need from the supervisor at those stages. Yeah. If you're looking at high end, you know, and you're starting to get to big dollar things, you probably want a full time supervisor. supervisor. Yeah, yep. You don't want those guys doing yep. too many projects because no. uh, high end properties by nature can evolve and there's changes and sometimes clients have different requirements yep. as work's done. Yep. Now, so you've said 18, 20, above that is probably getting too much. What's the worst that you've seen? Have you seen someone looking after 100 properties? Oh, no, you do hear stories of 40 and, you know, these right. kind of ones, but you'll find that there is a, a turnover of supervisors. They right. just get burnt out. Right. Um, right. Yeah, and, sure. it's, and it's hard to manage because as we were talking earlier, yeah. Um, it's ebbs and flows with the construction industry. So yep. when the work's busy, you've got to take it um, yep. and they don't always have the resources to deal with the high demand. Yep. Now, now you mentioned before that um, when clients are um, going through the build process, there's certain stages and that you can review it at each of these stages and they have access. So that, that leads me to a couple of questions. We'll start with things that are specific to your process. People don't have to engage you at each stage. You can be engaged at a particular stage. In your view, 
firstly, take us through the different stages, okay. you know, quickly yep. and, and then, or, or briefly, and then tell us which stage you think is the most important for structural integrity, for example. Okay, so the five stages as per the standard contracts and consumer law is the base stage, yes. which is either concrete slab or stumps or subflooring at that stage. Okay. Then you have your frame stage, then you have your lock-up or pre-plaster stage, yep. and then you have your completion inspection, which is uh, more often than not done at what they refer to as practical completion. Right. And then there's the final kind of handover stage as well. So that's the fifth stage, is that final handover? Well, completion yeah. is completion. where we come in. The handover is essentially when you get the key. Okay. When it's, you know, we're ready to go. And we want to make sure that everything's done by that stage. Yep. If you were to look at, at those individual stages, they all have an importance and yep. a role to play. Yep. Your building surveyor has a mandatory three um, inspections, which is the base, the frame, and the completion or the occupancy. Okay. So he'll look after those areas. So for me, um, if you had to pick one, okay. it's always the completion because that's the right. finished product. Right. That's what you want to um, right. you know, make sure you're getting what you paid for. Is there anything that you can't pick up by then? Like, let's say it's gone too far. Is there anything by completion that you say, well, we can't check this anymore because the building's complete and I can't yeah. check it? Well, yeah. uh, quite often that pre-plaster one is an important one because right. that's what closes up the, the frame or the structure of the building. Okay. So we might be say, you know, we've got to check that pipes have been um, checked in properly and run through walls. Okay. Cables have been clipped off, that okay. bracing's been secured properly and installed properly. Yep. So yeah, it's important all the way through. Okay, so pre-plaster, you can still get to a lot of these little things that might make a big difference. Yep. What about um, the slab? Uh, uh, when, you, when you're at practical completion, can you still check the slab? No, no, no. it's okay. difficult. Well, you, you yep. can because there are some guides and tolerances as to how far a slab can be out over the full dimension of a property right. and also within a room. Right. For us, it's better to check the slab when it's you know, it's finished a couple of days later yep. because we put levels over the top and we can check the perimeter, we can make sure the groundwork's all okay. Right. So, yeah. And, and what sort of things would you pick up that a surveyor or an inspector wouldn't pick up on a, on a slab or a frame, for example? Well, again, it's that it's that uh, around that workmanship. So yep. we'll check the levels. Yep. Um, the surveyor... What does, what does that mean, the levels? So the finished finish surface level. So okay. we'll use laser levels or water levels to make sure that the slab is flat. Yes. Um, the surveyor, um, for his slab inspection, checks the pre pour Right. Which is essentially before the concrete has, has been um, uh, installed. Right. So he's checking for the engineering, the footing layouts, the plumbing requirements. Okay. What I come along afterwards to make sure that the slab is being um, finished correctly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So he's looking really to make sure that the whole thing doesn't collapse and that's not going to be a legal, yeah. a legal issue. And essentially, look, there's some guys out there that will do a pre-slab uh, inspection. Yeah. For me personally, the, the slab doesn't get poured until the surveyor signs off, so it's a double up. Okay. So okay. We, we look at the completed stage because that again aligns to what the client has to pay the builder for. Sure. And, and tell me, have you had um, some stories where, I mean, with every single build that you go out to, is it always, if have you ever had a build where there's nothing that you can't you can't report on anything? No, it's unlikely. And again, right. it's you know it's, it's a custom-made product yep. by humans. Yep. And look, you're also um, dealing with tolerances in application, yep. tolerances in standards, tolerances even material supply. Yep. So there's always going to be items that yep. we'll find. Yep. Um, and again, my approach is, is just to report on it is what it is, and then yep. as long as it can be rectified then it's, by the end, yep. we'll, we'll get we'll get the product over the line. So the, assuming that the surveyor's <coughs> gone in and they've checked the build and said this is by national standards, we're okay, yep. then you've said yes, but it's it's not, the workmanship isn't up to scratch. What is the legal obligation of the builder to actually rectify it? Do they have a legal obligation? So if you, and a really good thing for your clients is if you have a look at um, Consumer Affairs Victoria, there's a whole range of information on there for new builds. Yep. And so that any builder has a, an obligation to provide uh, a product for consumers that meets you know, quality of workmanship. It has uh, Im implied warranties to say that work will be done to a certain standard. Mm -hmm. um, so that protects essentially you as the client. Yes. So that's a really good thing for anybody that's approaching a new contract is to do that homework yep. and understand what they're, you know, what they're entitled to. And so that is more about workmanship and what is the meaning of workmanship? Is it a very, um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of my idea of good workmanship and your idea might be completely different. So. Yeah, so that's why, um, and even now there's, there's um, what builders will want to see is people like myself who are registered building practitioners yes because in the eyes of a, um, a mediator or someone in dispute they're going to say well what is the qualifications of the person making these observations because yep. at a time it is an opinion based 
report, yep. uh, you do fall back onto standards and, and construction codes. Yep. So yeah, you've got to make sure, you know, I've got 35 years of construction experience, so yep. people would deem me as having that um, having the sufficient experience. knowledge. Yep. Yeah. And I assume that the builders would be would welcome someone that has construction experience as well because you understand their point of view a little yeah, bit. Yeah, and you look, yep. and like with consultants, you see a range of supervisors that vary from guys that are just starting out yep. to guys that have been doing it for you know, forever for 30 years. Yeah, right. So, you know, as I said, we all just work together. Yep. Okay, so let's say that somebody, I mean, for me, the advice is, and we do tell all of our clients to engage a consultant. Yep. We, we're, we're very pro, pro consultants because there's things that you will pick up that none of us could possibly pick up, right? Yep. And the good builders I've noticed, and I'm sure you would agree, really welcome it. They love it because it's Correct. an extra set of eyes. It gets a really good quality finish, etc. cetera. Yep. So they, they welcome it. Let's say someone can't. Let's say that it's blowing their budget. You know, what are some of the things that they could do to to check a bill? What what should they be looking out for? Well, look, you can you know, like anything on the internet, you can find checklists. So yes. it's quite extensive. So depending on the stages, mm -hmm. um, you can find those lessons. But it's yep. it, if I can relate it to, it's a bit like buying a car. Yep. You don't buy a car without having a licensed mechanic. Check do it. a roadworthy, which yep. is essentially a checklist as well. Yep. So as much as you might um, have budget concerns, yep. if you've got the time to invest, it's going to be well worth it. And I and I do say to clients, it, this is going to be worth a lot more than the five hundred to two thousand dollars you're going yep. to spend. So if it, it, let's let's go to cost actually. Yep. Um, so what is the cost at each stage, and what's a package like? What what are the different costs? Okay, cost so for me, each stage inspection is somewhere between the sort of four hundred to six hundred dollar mark, sure. depending on that, and then sort of your completion stage is somewhere between your five to seven hundred. Okay. And the reason that is is it varies on construction type and size. Right. Um, right. So I had a regional one yesterday. There was some additional travel for regional. So. Right. Okay. Yeah, but it's it's okay. if, if you're looking at sort of the four stage or five stage inspection, you're somewhere between the two and three thousand dollar mark for a whole project. Okay. So really, in the whole scheme of things, for a two hundred fifty thousand dollar plus per it's, it's not it's not big money and no. especially you know if you're it depends if you're a first home buyer it's it's obviously something you've got a budget for but if you're an investor it's a tax deduction as well yep uh, we yep. represent a lot of clients from interstate got one this afternoon that's from Sydney right so it's it's a no-brainer for those guys right absolutely yeah so now what I want to talk about is the rights of the client so the person engaging the builder Mm -hmm. um, a, a, during the build process because there's some confusion about that. So they can't just turn up to the construction site whenever they like. No, well, not no. A, and it's, it's, it's kind of hard because you've bought this block of land, it's yours. Yep. But what happens is when you engage the builder in that contract, he owns that block for the period of that contract. It's an easy way of putting it. Right. And the reason they do that is, is because it becomes a workplace. Yes. Okay, so there's a whole lot of you know workplace uh, health and safety regulations that come into it. So that's why part of the structure of the five base stages is that's the time that the builder actually formally invites you to come and check you know the progress of the property yep. and then when you're happy with that you make the payment right one of the things I see all the time is people driving around on weekends driving around on nights they're excited they've mm. got little kids climbing ladders and you know mum trying to you know walk through the mud and do all these things yeah which is not encouraged yeah um, and what leads to that quite often is um, if they've got a keen eye they'll be on the phone saying the builder hasn't done this or he hasn't done that and it's like well you explain it's not quite ready and it's still evolving between that next stage. Yep. The other issue for turning up on weekends and, and after work and stuff is you, you're likely to be not insured in case anything happens yep. because you haven't done a site induction with the builder yes. and you have probably more than likely not wearing um, the appropriate PPE which is boots and you know yep. safety gear. Yep. So it's really important to follow protocol which is yep. to go at each stage, give the builder a chance to get to that stage yep. and then follow protocol go and review it if you want to. A lot of my clients actually don't do that, they yeah. leave it to their consultant. So, we had a scenario recently where a gentleman um, picked up that there was an incorrect window type put in from yeah. the weekend. Yeah. So our recommendation was just put that in writing to an email and yeah. then request to meet the supervisor on site. And okay. then that way it's all done because if the supervisor's there accompanying you, he's kind of responsible for your safety and, and guiding yeah. you through the problem. And that's okay. Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's within reason. Had he driven past and seen that? Oh, he lived around the corner, right. he was there every okay. night. Okay, so, so if he hadn't picked that up, they would have had to take the window out late at a later stage. Yeah, which yeah. may have been, you know, cause further delays with the builder because if plaster and those type of things had gone yeah. in, yeah. it's going to yeah, yeah. cause a few more problems. So with delays, that's a really interesting one. Mm -hmm. What are some acceptable delays okay. from, from the builder? Well, the, the biggest one 
that um, is in any contract which happens in Melbourne is weather. Yeah. Okay, which yep. is, you know, it's unforeseen circumstances. Yes. Sometimes there was a little bit of COVID, I think they've got through it now, some um, supply shortage of materials. Mm -hmm. um, so that can flare up from time to time, especially if it's um, specified something a little bit out of left field, if it's a customised product. Right. Um, you've got to make sure your allowance. Yep. And there are always unforeseeable circumstances um, yep. if, you know, the builder, and for instance, goes to cut the, the ground, prepare for the slab, and they find some additional, you know, soil conditions or rock or something that wasn't picked up, that can cause delays as well. Right. With inclement weather, which mm -hmm. is what it's called mm -hmm. in, the, in the building contracts, what, at what point does weather not matter anymore? Because you get to a point in the build where you can work on it, whether it's raining, etc. So at what point, so how many months have you got? And, and what is the time frame for each stage? Give us a sense of what, how much, how long we should be waiting and okay. at what point doesn't weather matter? Yeah, well, it's it's always challenging. So for with the, you're putting a concrete slab in and you've got that pre-concrete pour, you've got trenches and holes everywhere. You don't want that filling up with water. Right. So it's really important that that gets done quickly. Yep. Um, generally from a cut to a slab pour can be a week to two weeks, right. just depends. Right. And then once the slab's down, the, the frame will start. Yep. Uh, generally the builders will get uh, materials delivered within a couple of days and the frames, depending on size, could take two, four, six weeks, just right. depends right. Uh, on time, trade availability. And then really the critical thing is from the frame is to get a roof on and start to get to what we refer to as the lock-up stage right. where it's kind of, you know, weatherproof yep. and then the internal trades can start. Right, um, and that doesn't matter about weather. So you, you might be three months before you're at a point where inclement weather may not affect you. Correct, right? yeah, and there's yeah. always going to be finishing stages. One of the key things, um, especially which you don't always see, is when a roof goes on, you've got to make sure that the builder has temporary stormwater connected yep. so that there's not flooding or water pulling around around the site. Yep, right, yeah. right. And, and so um, which stage is the most critical, in your view, to timing? So which is, I always say to clients, and I might be wrong, that it's really the start getting to site Correct, because yeah. that's where there's lots of holdups yeah um, would you agree yeah with and that? you know yeah. and if you're talking it's always better to build over the summer months mm. um, the other thing with summer months especially in Melbourne is you've got daylight savings so some of yeah. the keen trades yeah get longer work hours than Melbourne in July when it's yep. you know dark from sort of eight in the morning or you know by four yep. in the afternoon you're losing light. Yep. So. But but the builders interests are aligned. I mean they yep. want to finish that build as quickly as they can. Most definitely. So we see a lot of builds completed in five to six months. Yep. Um, yep. Like completely done, ready ready to hand yep. over and be rented or, yep. or lived in, yep. which is great. In your view what's a standard build? Time? Oh again it's, if you're talking that sort of four bedroom you know single story somewhere between 24 to 36 Six weeks is, right. is about where they're at right. um, and again it's, it comes down to availability of site trades equipment getting it through again that role of the supervisor who's coordinating yep. everybody making sure they're getting there yep. uh, and what can have a bit of a knock-on effect when we're talking about delays before is if a particular trade has you know slowed up or dragged the chain a bit and hasn't quite finished yep. that can affect other trades that were scheduled to come in so that can cause delays well that's uh, one of the things i say to my clients is once once they start at site do not delay them because if you delay them for any reason unless it's a really good reason yep. and you cannot you know there's a structural issue yep. um then that'll put all the tradies out and it's that's the biggest issue yeah, is getting the trades it's, in on it's time. project management yep. you know and yep. you'll find that uh, a lot of the builders you know, they'll do your work before you sign up to a builder and get everything locked down because if you want to go down the road of variations, they'll charge you for it yes. because they don't want, yep. they don't want to be dealing with variations because what also happens is once that package is put together at the start, variations can be easily missed because if the information doesn't flow through to the appropriate, absolutely, you know, trade or supervisor, yep. Yep. Um, it's not uncommon for variations to be missed. To be missed. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> on that, what... If you, if you, let's go back to your son. Your son's building a yeah. building a house. We know that you're going to tell him that he needs a, bi a building yes. consultant. How does he pick a builder? What are some of the things that people should be asking well, about the builder? First thing is do a do a check on the Victorian Building Authority, yep. which is the VBA, yes. um, to make sure that the builder is licensed, yes. insured. Yep. Okay. I then basically, you know, with the internet now, you do some reviews. I, I even did a review on a builder I've got a job starting in about two weeks for yes just to see I was a bit nervous yep. and there wasn't some favorable reviews so I yep. know I've got to make sure we're looking at yep. you know we're some doing it things. right yeah um, 
talk to other customers, ring yep. some other customers, okay. drive past some sites. Mm. Um, yeah, there's a whole lot of things that you can do. So be proactive. Yeah, just yep. be careful too. Um, they're getting build better now, but some of the builders used to quite often put very high-end finishes in their display homes. Yes. So that they really uh, evoke the emotion of what you're buying, yep. but doesn't always line up with the package that you've actually selected. Well, one of the series in this builder series is about some of the tricks of, this, of, yeah. of some of the retail builders. And, and one of the things is that what you see, a lot often those display homes are actually built by a completely different team yep. than their own team. Yep. So they are there as an advertising plaque. That's all it is really, Correct. right? Correct. And, you know, and in a display yep. home, for instance, they might put down natural timber flooring that yep. looks wow. And by the time you look at your package, you've got a laminate yep. you know, version of it. So Yeah, but the laminate versions now are much better. They're much more durable. The, much they are. Quality. Personally, I'm not a fan of them, but yep. that's, you know, everyone's it's own choice. Their own. Yeah. And it's price point, yeah. isn't it? Depends yeah. what your price yeah, is. Correct. Right. Okay. So your, your advice is to get out there, um, really ask a lot of questions, speak to people. My only issue with, um, with reviews is that you can get competitors making Google reviews that are, you know, the, the Google reviews can be quite false. I've even heard a story about a builder who was pet Sending, saying, if you do a good review for us, we'll send you out this hamper. Oh, it's like really? a thousand dollar hamper. Okay. So it's quite easy to bribe people into making a little yeah, statement. The, you know? I, I, no, you're yep. right, and yep. that's what happens. But, you know, it's like um, getting multiple quotes. Somewhere in the middle lies the truth. That's right. So, Absolutely. So yeah, the order, yeah. one of the things that I look for, tell me what you think of this, is if somebody's made a bad comment, yep. what's the response? Correct. What have they said in response? We'd like to talk to you, you know, without being defensive. Anyone that's defensive, I'm always very nervous about. Yep. Whereas if they take some responsibility, because I always say to my clients that builders make mistakes and, and they, they should live by how they deal with that mistake rather than never making a mistake. Well, you know yourself, it, yep. it doesn't matter whether it's building or not. It really, when you're selecting to work with somebody, yep. it's how are they going to communicate, how are they yep. going to respond, who's the go-to person, Yes. Uh, because we get frustrated when we're, you know, sending emails off and no one's listening. No one's so, responding. Yeah. So that's a good way, you know, is to yep. talk to those in the sales departments of the builders and say, well, who's going to guide me and who's going to help me if I do have issues yep. and when can I expect responses. Great, thank you. So as a recap, um, when you're building, we know we need an, a consultant. We understand that the that the surveyor is just looking at the national um, standards and making sure that we comply with national standards. It's a very little amount to spend, given you're going to be purchasing a property or building something that's going to cost about 250000 um, And we know that every stage really is significant to the, to the final product. Yeah, correct. So thanks very much for your time, that's Adam. That's okay. Thanks for having me. Yes, a pleasure. Pleasure. Um, we look forward to having you again. Okay. No worries, talk okay. soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Building your very own home from scratch is an important aspiration for many Australians and its impact on the economy is absolutely enormous. The building industry contributes about $360 billion to GDP. It creates so many jobs, it keeps local manufacturers happy and probably gets some politicians elected. So it's for this reason that there are many financial benefits to building a new home. Stamp duty savings, tax incentives, depreciation benefits and even the COVID-19 federal building grant. Grant. So during the COVID pandemic in 2020, the Australian Federal Government introduced a grant that awarded new home builders $25,000 just for building a new home. Nothing else to it. So this much money swishing around in the building industry creates many opportunities for suppliers and as a result, a whole lot of competition. So there are thousands of builders competing for your business. They have very big marketing budgets and they are very, very clever at finding ways to just get you in the door. So in this, our Eda Property New Builder series, we help you navigate this complex and highly competitive space. We want you to understand what you need to know about the different builders, about the building process, about legislation and the industry overall to get this experience right for you. I hope you're enjoying our new builder series. Up next, we're going to be talking about areas to invest in for the best capital growth. And we'll actually be taking you on a research tour of one of the hottest growth areas in Australia at the moment. If you are enjoying the series, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe below. And if you have any comments or questions for me or anyone else at the EDA Property team, please feel free to leave a comment. Speak to you soon. Thanks for watching.